Praise be Jesus Christ, and thank you for joining me for this lesson on matrimony from the Animode Basic Course. In all of our lessons, we've looked at the Old Testament uh, reality, uh, whatever it's a person, place, or thing, and then saw how it points towards a reality in the New Testament. And so in this course, we're going to be looking at marriage in the Old Testament, particularly Adam and Eve, one married couple, and then Noah, his wife, and, their, and his three sons and their wives. That's four married couples. Those couples are going to kind of renew. God's going to recreate with those four married couples, and that's going to point us towards the wonderful sacrament of matrimony, which is a life-giving sacrament. Um, and so we see in the nuptial blessing that it alone, this is marriage, that it alone was not withdrawn either by the punishment of original sin or by the sentence of the flood. So we lost many, many things, uh, of course, and after original sin and after the flood, but we did not lose marriage. Marriage was not taken from us. Um, and so we look at the beginning. Uh, we see after Adam and Eve, there was a fall. Um, we see Cain and Abel, and then we see all these different sins, basically. And the sins during the time of Noah, people have said, is, is really sexual sins and violence, but just a revolt against God. And so uh, in our last lessons, we've, we've learned about how God is going to then cleanse the world from that sin, creating a church, the ark in which people can go into. But also what we see here is inside that ark are four married couples. And it will be this seed, right, these four married couples, which will then um, recreate in a sense. Um, and so this natural institution of marriage is going to point towards a sacramental reality. And we read in Ephesians 5.32 that this is a great sacrament. But I speak of Christ and the church. Paul is telling us this, that marriage actually uh, points us to Christ and the church. Um, and so the natural institution points us to the supernatural. In the nuptial blessing again, we say, O oh God, who by so excellent a mystery has consecrated the union of man and woman as to foreshadow in this nuptial bond the union of Christ and his church. So one of the, the greatest things about marriage is it is actually a sign for a deeper reality, and that is the reality of the Trinity. So what we see in this man and woman in each marriage is that you have a groom that is going to love his bride. The bride is going to reciprocate that love and life bears forth. This is a sign, right? The groom loving the bride, the bride loving the groom, life coming forth is a sign. It points us to a deeper reality of Christ and his church. Christ loves the church. The church responds to that love and there's new life baptism. And this, Christ and his church, is even a sign of something deeper, right? More transcendent, which is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father loving the Son, the Son returning that love, and the shared love between the Holy Spirit, which is the eternal life, the divine life, the Trinitarian life. So marriage will then point to Christ and the church. Christ and the church then will point to the Trinity. Holy matrimony is one of the seven sacraments. A good definition for a sacrament is it's a sensible sign, right? With our tangible senses, eyes, ears, mouth, we can, we can uh, sense these. It's instituted by Jesus Christ, by which an invisible grace and inward sanctification holiness are communicated to the soul. It's the divine life to the soul. An easy way to remember this is four parts. An outward sign, inner grace, instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church. In this lesson, we're going to go ahead and go through the four parts of that sacrament and tie it into the sacrament of matrimony. So first we look at the outward sign. What is the outward sign of matrimony? Very simple. The, the matter or the stuff of matrimony is one man and one woman. Uh, then we look at the inner grace. What, what graces are given in matrimony? And there's going to be a little anacronym that we're going to use, Mrs. P. Dimple. So the dimple part is actually the graces. Um, and then it's instituted by Christ. We see that the Father, Son, Holy Spirit instituted this natural institution in Genesis 2. Jesus Christ will elevate it to a sacrament, a supernatural, in John 2, which was our reading from the Lectio Divina. And then it's entrusted to the church. Who has the ultimate authority on the, what marriage is? It's not the people, it's not the state, but it's the church. Um, so let's look first at this anacronym, Mrs. P's Dimple. So just remember that, Mrs. P's Dimple. The MRSP is like the foundation. So think of this as the foundations to build a house and then the tools necessary to build the house. Mutual support, remedy of concupiscence, sacrament or sign, and procreation and education. So the MRSP is your foundation. Think of it as uh, four pillars, right? Four cornerstones there. And these are the ends of marriage. This is what marriage is all about. This is the purpose, you could say. Uh, the purpose, the pillars, the ends of marriage. Mutual support, 
remedy of concupiscence, sacrament and sign, and procreation education. Now, what are the tools that needed? These are the graces needed to then build upon this foundation. It would be the duties of the man and woman, the fact that it's indissoluble, it's monogamous, permanent, it's open to life, and it is exclusive. These are all the graces that come to a person, uh, a man and a woman, when they enter into this sacred bond. Let's first look at the M in Mrs. P's dimple. So the M stands for mutual support. Um, what does it mean, mutual support? It means that I'm going to be willing to give to the other what they are rightly due. Um, when you give to someone what they're rightly due, that's a matter of justice. So this is a marriage is a contract and justice. I am saying I will give to this person what they're rightly due. The consent and the vows actually speak to this. I name, take you name, for my lawful wife, husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, right? It's permanent, for better, worse, rich, poor, sickness and in health to love and cherish until death do us part. So I'm going to give you what you are due no matter what the circumstance. So in other words, there is no conditions put on this. I'm going to do it when it's bad and when it's good, when it's rich, when it's poor, sickness and in health until death do us part. So there are no conditions put on this and it is actually permanent and it's also exclusive. I'm going to give this to you. This is such a great thing that, that two people can mutually support each other and have that bond. So again, let's look at what is this, uh, this, this mutual support based on. Again, no conditions. Better, worse, sick, and health, and richness, and in poorness, right? And to have and to hold. I have this one person that will do this for me to give me what we're rightly due. Um, this is such an amazing benefit to two people. Um, I, I think you can probably think of someone in your life, a marriage that has uh, done this so well. Um, and regardless of the case, I think of my father-in-law um, who was at the side of my mother-in-law for eight years during uh, her, her battle with Alzheimer's. Um, she had suffered greatly, so there was, there was that sickness there. And it was times, very difficult times, where you have that worse and you have that sickness. And yet he still gives her what she is rightly due, gives her respect, gives her love, gives her honor, gives, cherishes her. And, and, does, and keeps up his end of the deal when he made that consent, when he made that vow. This is what it means to mutually support, to help someone get to heaven, not only to help them get to heaven, but while we're here on earth, to help people, support people through the trials of this life. And that is what the, the two people agree to do, to mutually support each other during this life and to help each other get to heaven. We'll now move on to the R in Mrs. P's dimple. And the R stands for remedy of concupiscence. Uh, we'll go through this. I, I think remedy of concupiscence, the concupiscence we're speaking about here is uh, carnal lust. So we're talking about sexual sins here and the desire uh, for sexual sins or sexual activity. Um, there is no doubt that this has been obviously an issue throughout uh, human history. Um, 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us, But for fear of fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render the debt to his wife, and the wife also in like manner to the husband. 1 Corinthians 7, 2 through 3. So St. Paul is saying here there is a fear of fornication. There is a fear of sexual activity outside of marriage. And that this is not as God has planned it. So man still has the sexual urge. Woman has the sexual urge. So where does it find its home? The sexual urge finds its home within marriage. Uh, this is the right place for the sexual urge. Um, and it hel helps properly order the sexual urge. So when you think about this, think about two roads here. And think of a median inside. Um, you can think of the median inside these two roads um, as, as a safe place. But, but not so safe if you don't have boundaries around it. So think of the sexual urge being placed within the median, but then a boundary around it. Um, and so when we look at sexual urge, there are rules that apply, or it does get definitely disordered. Uh, the first rule is it needs sexual activity needs to be within marriage, and then not only within marriage, but according to the teachings of the church. And so we see all these different things outside of that, lust, masturbation, fornication, which we just read, pornography, prostitution, rape, homosexual acts, contraception, and then we see also offenses against marriage in general, but they usually have to do with sexual act as well, adultery, divorce, polygamy, incest, free unions, and trial marriages. 
Um, so with all of this, these are these things outside. Um, we already see polygamy entering in in Genesis 4, 19. All these things are kind of intruding in on marriage. And so we want to make sure that these things do not come into marriage and that we don't go out for these things. So don't bring these sins into the marriage, but also don't go outside of marriage. I think a good analogy here for the sexual urge would be, you know, if, if I have the desire to do a certain thing, I have to do it in the proper way. Um, we would only know the proper way according to, of course, God's will for something. And so we ask, what is God's intention for the sexual act? But think for a second if I have a, a desire to uh, hit some golf balls and you know, I just have this uh, urgent need to hit golf balls. Well, I can't just take a bunch of balls, let's say 50, a basket of 50 golf balls, and go out in my front yard and just start hitting golf balls. I live, I, I live in a neighborhood, so I would break windows. I would, you know, maybe uh, some, a kid would be riding his bike and I would hit the kid off the bike. And so I, I can't just take my, my urge to hit golf balls and just go to the front yard and start hitting the golf balls. I have to take that urge and properly order it. And so I take my urge to hit golf balls, I take it to, I get in my car, I drive 10 minutes, I go to a driving range, and then I put the, the bucket of balls down and I hit away. And then that urge is done in the correct way and it's fruitful. And, and so the same thing uh, with the sexual urge. The sexual urge God has created as a good thing, right? God creates good things. Uh, sin comes in when there's a misuse of that good, a deprivation of that good. And so with the sexual urge, we want to make sure it has its home, it has its proper context. The proper context for the sexual urge is within marriage. And so marriage then is actually the healing of that, that, that desire, that strong desire for the sexual urge. Uh, one of the greatest benefits of marriage is that it, it creates a home for the sexual desire in which it can be ordered according to God's will. We've already spoken about the consent of the man towards the woman, them giving their word. Well, actually, in the sexual act within marriage, they are going to consummate. That, cons that word consummate means consuma, with totality. So they're going to follow up their word with the action of actually giving their body. We would call this a debt, but a debt not in a negative sense, but a debt in a positive, a debt of love. I want to give my body to you. Again, as Jesus gives his body to the church and the church gives her body back to Christ. And so in this way, a man and a woman, their body is not their own because they become one flesh. The two become one. And this is also one of the most beautiful things about marriage is that that bond, not just in word, but also in, in the physicalness of, of the sexual act. Uh, for uh, St. Paul continues to say in 1 Corinthians 7, the wife hath not the power over her own body, but the husband, and like manner, the husband also hath not power of his own body, but the wife. So they are giving to each other even the gift of self, um, the gift of their very body. This again is a sign, a sacrament of the way that Christ loves his church and the church loves Christ. We're going to look a little bit closer at the word concupiscence and remedy. Um, there, remedy just means to heal, actually to heal back. Uh, I don't think anyone would uh, disagree that the sexual urge needs a healing in our society and each and a person. Uh, concupiscence, that word, it comes from, if you see that word cupis there, it means like Cupid, like the angel that shoots people and has them have desire. So concupiscence just means with a desire, so to heal back this desire. If we look in Ephesians 4, 26, desires in and of themselves, passions, do not have to be sinful. We, we see in Ephesians that if you will be angry, but sin not, all right? So think about this. Uh, we can be angry, but we can't let it turn into wrath or gluttony. We can be hunger, have hunger and thirst, but we can't have that turn into gluttony. Uh, we can want safety and security, but not have it turn into greed. We can want rest, right? We need rest, but we can't turn that into sloth. Um, and then, of course, we, we need to be fertile and multiply, have that sexual urge, but we ha can't have that turn into lust. So marriage enables us to, to, again, place the sexual urge in the proper context, ordered according to God's holy will. There's a saying that says, um, the way that family goes, that's the way society will go. So if we see problems in society, there's probably problems in the family. If we see problems in the family, there's probably problems in marriage. 
And so we going back to kind of our analogy between the red house and the blue house, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan, if Satan wants to destroy society and if he ultimately wants to try to attack the kingdom of God, he can't destroy it, but if he wants to attack it, um, he will attack, of course, families. And if he wants to really get the ruin of families, then he needs to attack marriages. Um, and so this is Satan's plan, is to get to society through the family and through marriage. Um, and we'll see how he does this. Um, but this is definitely the plan, and we see this. There was a letter from St. Lucia, I'm sorry, Sister Lucia, who I think is saint now, Sister Lucia from Fatima to Cardinal Kafara, who was the founder of the JP2 Institute on Marriage and Family. And she said, or she wrote, Father, a time will come when the decisive battle between the kingdom of Christ and Satan will be over marriage and the family. So this is the decisive battle. This is where Satan is, 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 is going to attack because this is so precious to God. God has, is renewing society through marriage. So when we look at this, we see that there is a natural institution of marriage. It's going to be real important here to look at the comparison between Genesis 2 and John 2. Genesis 2, John 2, both are new starts. And so uh, we see that in the beginning, Genesis 2, God created the institute of marriage, a natural institution. Jesus is going to take that natural institution and elevate it to a supernatural sacrament in John 2. So Genesis 2, natural. John 2 is going to be supernatural, the water into the wine. That's what Jesus wants to do. Now, the natural and the supernatural are alike in all ways, except for the fact that in the Mrs. P's dimple, the S stands for sacrament. That is exclusive only to the supernatural. Jesus takes the natural and elevates it to the supernatural. Satan, who mocks Jesus in all things, wants to pollute the water. Where there is mutual support, he wants there to be selfishness. Where there's the remedy of concupiscence, he wants there to be sex, power, and pleasure. Instead of procreation, he wants contraception. Instead of that duty of between man and woman, he wants that to be lie or broken down. Instead of indissolvability, he wants divorce. Instead of monogamy, he wants polygamy. Instead of um, permanence, he wants divorce. Instead of life, he wants contraception. And instead of exclusivity, he wants adultery. We see that the two most common things here are contraception and divorce. The, these are where I think these are the biggest attacks that Satan has against both the natural and the supernatural sacrament of marriage. Again, contraception and divorce. How easily do these two things creep into our, our marriages, creep into our families, and creep into our society? We see this very much. Even these two things have been legalized. Uh, contraception in the 1930s. Um, and divorce in the 1960s. So uh, within a, even the last hundred years, uh, Satan has definitely attacked through contraception and through divorce. Satan is also going to attack the very nature of what we see in Genesis 1. So he's attacking the bedrock. He's going to attack the fertility, be fertile and multiply, but he's also going to attack even masculinity and femininity. So when we look back at these scriptures, it's you know Genesis 1:27 and Genesis 1:28, we see Genesis 1:27 and God created man to his own image, to the image of God he created him, male and female he created him. Satan wants to attack that masculinity and femininity. Why? Because male and female are in the image of God. He hates the image of God, and so he attacks the, the image, male and female, of that. He also wants to attack this increase and multiply. God said, increase and multiply, fill the earth. He wants to attack this. He wants to talk this through contraception, through abortion, any way he can. He does not want humanity to increase and multiply. Um, not only did God say this to Adam in Genesis 1.28, but he will reiterate this, right? Um, when he recreates with those four married couples, which we're talking about, Adam or Noah, it will be, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, increase and multiply and fill the earth. It's the exact same thing at creation in, in Genesis 1 and then the recreation in Genesis 9 to increase and multiply, fill the earth. Again, these are where Satan is attacking. He's attacking this through contraception. He's attacking this through the attack of masculinity and femininity. We have gone through uh, the M, the R, and the S of the Mrs. part, Mrs. P. So the M again is mutual support. These are the, the ends and the purposes of marriage, right? The mutual support of the couple, the remedy of concupiscence that the sexual act has a home, and then the sign or the sacrament that Jesus takes a natural institution and elevates it to the supernatural. Now we're going to talk about procreation and education. So that last part, the P, Mrs. P. 
The P is for procreation and education. Um, again, this is what Satan is attacking. Uh, we see, of course, Genesis 128, be fertile and multiply. Again, Genesis 9, be fertile and multiply. Um, with every sexual act, when new life is created, I love this, when, when, when new life is created, there's three gifts that take place, three gifts for every life. There is the sperm given by the father, there is the egg given by the mother, and there is the soul given by God. Um, so everyone listening to this video, you would not be here, I would not be here, unless there was the gift that was given. So each of us is a gift, but we came from three gifts. Okay? Um, we have humans, of course, the human person, um, and of the human per person, there's male and female. We have the angelic, um, so we, we've learned about the angels already, and then we have the divine, which is actually the trinity. When we're looking at human, we have male and female, man and woman, only two. There's not a third or a fourth or a fifth type. This is in Genesis 1, 27. This is our gender. This is why this is so important. Um, again, the man and the woman are going to take together what only they have, right? They are going to conceive. That's what it means to conceive is to take together. This is Genesis 1, 28, to be fertile and multiply. Contraception means to not take together. So what is it that we're taking together, the conceiving part? Well, we're taking together the sperm given by the man, the egg given by the woman, and this is where we get the body. Uh, remember, a human person is both body and soul. We get our body from the man and the woman. We get the soul from the divine, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So every single human person, three gifts, the, the sperm, again, from the father, the egg from the mother, right, within marriage, and then we have the soul given by God. So the P is not just procreation, but also education. We, we want to, of course, conceive, uh, take these two people together and take what they give, the man and the woman, and that love brings forth life. Remember, man loves the woman, the woman receives that, returns that love, and that brings forth life. Um, so there's that procreation, and then there's also the education. Um, and this, as, as just as the, the sperm and the egg meet within the womb, we're going to see that then the baby, the life, will move from the womb to the home. So in this, uh, in, in marriage, what's so important is that marriage gives, uh, puts a fence in a sense, a sense of protection around the womb, but also around the home. And, and what happens in the womb and what happens in the home is life. And the womb is where procreation takes place. And in the home is where education takes place. In the nuptial blessing, we read, May they both, the man and the woman, see their children's children to the third and fourth generation, and may they reach the old age which they desire. We've already seen the, the beauty of the body and the soul. But where do the body and the soul meet? They, they meet within the womb of the mother. So this, what, a, what a special union that, that takes place within the womb of a woman. That body and soul, new life will take place. And it's only a mother that can do this. She can only bear and give birth. Um, this is the actual office of the mother, which we would call the mundi matris. This is where we get the word matrimony. Matrimony is named after the mother. This sacrament is named after the mother because it's only the mother that can bear and bring forth life. The father, which would be the, the patrimony, right? The, the patrimony would be to provide and protect. So matrimony points to the woman, the mother, and her office. This office, this duty is protected by the father. After birth has been taken place, then that it's not now in the womb, but in the, in the home. So it moves from the womb to the home. And in the home, this is where the mother then makes a home, nourishes, care for and educate and then the father of course protects that home and provides for the home this home should be a place of permanence that's why permanence is so important this home should be a place of life so let's look here at both the p and the r so mrs p right the p and the r the p is procreation the r is the remedy of concupiscence so let's focus on the sexual act and what is the meaning of the sexual act what is the purpose of the sexual act within marriage? Uh, the purpose of the sexual act within marriage is uh, first and foremost procreation and second a renewal of vows. Remember marriage is a sacrament in which the sexual act is a renewal of the vows and the vows mirror what Christ did on the cross. And so when a, when a groom gives himself to her, his bride, he is giving his body to the bride as Christ gives his body 
to his bride. Um, we want to make sure that that's always done in love and not in lust. And so Tobit 6.18 and also 8.9 stress this where it says, not for fleshly lust, but for the love of posterity. So again, this focus on procreation, the P here. Um, Genesis 1.28 in regards to Adam and Genesis 9.1 to Noah to be fertile and multiply. Homosexual acts, right? And also contraception are not procreative. Intrinsically, they are not procreative. We also look at the renewal of the vows, the vows that this man and woman took to be free, fruitful, right? Which leads to the procreation, full and faithful. That full mirrors Jesus Christ, the consumatum est, consuma, with totality. This is what Jesus does. He gives himself totally to us on the cross, right? He is free, he is fruitful, and he is faithful. And so the, the renewal of vows is not, is, is, is not only just a remedy of concupiscence, but it also merits grace, right, for the couple, and it is a sacrament. So this is a, a, a consolation and pleasure. It's the mutual support. It's a sacrament. It's a remedy, and it's procreative. Marriage is not only the place in which the sexual urge finds a home and finds order, but it's also in which a man and a woman can practice chastity to a heroic degree. So we know that chastity must always be practiced. Um, we see in the Catechism, Catechism 2352 says, the deliberate use of the sexual faculty for whatever reason outside of marriage is essentially contrary to its purpose. So we know that outside of marriage, of course, but what about inside marriage? Chastity still has to be practiced. So it says, uh, Paul tells us, defraud not one another except perhaps by consent for a time that you may give yourselves to prayer and return together again lest Satan tempt you for your incontinency. So even within marriage, there will be periods of continence, periods in which the people, the, the two will not be together. Um, and this is part of that chastity. So chastity should always be practiced according to one's state in life. We're all born, and of course, we all die. Um, so, so we will be in, in a certain state. We will be single, of course, the majority of our life, probably, or not the majority of our life, but we're obviously single at the beginning. Um, some people will uh, take the path or the vocation called to priesthood or religious life. Some people will be married. And so what is chastity in all of these states? Um, well, if you are a single person, and, and even if you return back to the single life after the death of your spouse, you are called to practice abstinence. That is chastity for you. Celibacy for the priest and the religious, which would mean no, no sexual activity at all. And then within marriage, the sexual activity is either two things. It's either the sexual act with your, with your spouse or continence, which is that period of uh, refraining from, from the sexual act, which St. Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 7. And so there's always kind of a few rules as far as the arousal and the affection. Um, outside of marriage, of course, don't arouse yourself, don't arouse others, and don't allow others to arouse you. Um, within a marriage, arousal has to have actually a purpose, and that purpose is to get to the sexual act and complete the sexual act. So arousal always has to be at the service um, uh, for the sexual act, for intercourse, um, and it has to be a means towards that end. We're going to move now into the D of the dimple, Mrs. P's dimple, the D, which is the duties. Um, we already talked about how this is a contract of justice to give to another what they're rightly due. And uh, these duties are really kind of summed up in the four F's of free, fruitful, faithful, and full. Um, but, but there are certain questions that are asked of the couple uh, before they consent, before they give their vows. Uh, but again, these are all tied to, of course, what Jesus does on the cross and in his life, his passion, death, and resurrection for us, um, this free, this faithful, fruitful, and full. So the questions are asked. I'm going to use my name here. Matthew and Angela, have you come here to enter into marriage without coercion, freely and wholeheartedly? The freely, of course, here, the free, the wholeheartedly, the full. And so part of the duty is to give yourself freely, no coercion, and to give your full self, holding nothing back. Faithful, are you prepared as you follow the path of marriage to love and honor each other as long as you both shall live? So this is a sense of faithfulness, you and only you. This is what the two, the duty of what they're giving to each other, this faithfulness. Fruitful, the question that's asked here is, are you prepared to accept children lovingly from God and to bring them up according to the law of Christ and his church, to accept children lovingly. This fruitfulness, of course, Jesus Christ was fruitful um, from his side. We already learned about this, poured forth blood and water, which gave us life. And so we look at these, uh, these questions, freely, wholeheartedly, to love, honor, as long as you both shall live, and then to accept children lovingly from God, 
and then to bring them up according to the law of Christ and his church. How do the, how do the four F's uh, tie into these? Of course, freely is the free, wholeheartedly is the full. To love and to honor means I will be faithful to you and I will be fruitful by accepting children from God. Um, these are also going to tie into what we're going to talk about now with the graces. So the duties to love and honor, the indissolubility, right? The monogamous uh, to my whole heart. I can only give my heart to one. Permanent, as long as I shall live. And life-giving, that I will accept children. Also exclusive, you and only you. So these are. this is the, the dimple that we'll talk about now. Part of this dimple is, uh, and, and the duties are also six different uh, statements or questions that are asked typically of a couple when they're preparing for marriage. And this is actually the nature and the obligation, of course, that obligation. What am I obligated to do? This is my duty of justice, this contract that I make. I give my word that I will do this, to give to the other what they're rightly due. And so this is what, in a sense, someone is signing up for, these six things. And these six things are non-negotiable. This is what marriage is, the nature and obligation. Do you agree to give sacrificially of yourself? right? Do you agree to share in marital intercourse, right? Because a sexual union is a part of marriage. Do you give your spouse the right to have children? Um, will you make an unconditional, right? Unconditional permanent commitment to this person to do these things, um, to be faithful to your spouse and to give your consent free and without any force. This is what it means to be married. Um, to not want these things is to not want marriage. Um, this is an act of the will. This is not just wishful thinking. This is an actual act of the will where you give your word. It is not about feelings um, because feelings come and go. It could be great feelings. That's wonderful. But this is a yes or no question. Do you agree to these things or do you not? Do you give your word? And then will you back up your word with your actions? So I remember it is the church that defines marriage. God created this institution. Jesus elevates this institution um, to the, the sacramental level. And so there's a precise definition of what marriage is, the nature and obligation of marriage. Um, the nature and obligation of marriage is not necessarily agreed upon by what the state thinks it is. States may differ in their agreement on that. People may differ in their agreement. That's why it's important that um, a person commits in front of the church because the church has a solid definition. So, for example, if you go to the Justice of the Peace, the Justice of the Peace may say something like this. You have agreed to live together as husband and wife and have pledged your faith in one another. By agreeing to these vows and exchanging rings, now by the authority vested in me in the state of Texas, I pronounce you husband and wife. Okay, but what is meant by you have agreed? Um, and who's going to hold you to that agreement, for instance? Uh, what if later I don't agree? What if the husband says, well, I don't agree to that anymore? That, was, uh, that wasn't permanent. See, the state of Texas is not necessarily saying it's permanent um, because they believe it to be dissolvable. Um, but a, a Catholic marriage, the nature and obligation is indissolvable. What is meant by faith and one another? So what is the other saying? What did the other mean when they said, I do? In a Catholic marriage, it's very precise what the other means. Um, because those six questions are asked, of course, those are the nature and obligation. This is what I am agreeing to do for the good of the other. And so when a person says, I do, the I do is known. Um, this, the kind of the third part of this, now by the authority vested in me by the state of Texas, I pronounce you husband and wife. Okay, so the authority of the state of Texas. Well, there was one point when Texas did not exist, right? But there was not a point when God did not exist. So the authority of God obviously <laughs> transcends the authority of Texas. Texas was founded in 1845. What if Texas goes away? Then what happens to that authority? So it is the church that is the authority, the ultimate authority of marriage. This is why when two people exchange their vows, give their I do, this I do must be done in the church. For a Catholic, this is an obligation. A Catholic must give their I do through, under the authority of the church. If a Catholic, a baptized a Catholic, whether it's two baptized Catholics or even one of the parties is Catholic, if they do this outside of the church, it is not a valid marriage because a state or even two people don't have the authority to recognize that um, marriage. And so it must be, of course, recognized by the church. Um, when this process takes place of someone wanting to recognize their marriage by the church, it really is a convalidation. They're taking their vows, um, they're taking that I do, and they want it to be strengthened. So we see this word convalidation, it just means with strength. I'm, I'm, taking, I'm putting strength to my I do. 
Um, so there are kind of three ways you can look at the I do. Um, an I do can be said by just the, the two people, the self, um, and maybe they say, I don't even need paperwork because a contract is not needed here. I'm just going to say I do. But this can be easily dissolved by those two people. There's over 7 billion people on the face of the earth, and so there could be 3 billion couples, and so there could technically be three different, 3 billion different ways to give this consent. And in the case of the state, you have the same thing. Uh, the two people give their consent, but again, it can be dissolved. How, how easily is it dissolved? Well, all you need is money, and all you need is that same state to undo what they did. And since there's 3,000 different counties, Justice of the Peace in the United States, then there's 3,000 different ways um, that this vows can be done. In the church, however, you have a man that gives the vow to the woman, the woman gives the vow to the man. This is indissoluble. This I do is a bond that cannot be broken, and there is one definition, one way to do this. Um, this vow then is done within the church, by the clergy, with the witnesses, and the right. If you have the I do given by the man and the woman, and, and the I do is done in front of the church, the clergy, the witness, and the right, this is an indissoluble bond. Um, this cannot be undone. What God has brought together, let no man put asunder. It is the church that has the ultimate authority of marriage. Uh, it defines marriage, and it, it, it defines its nature and teaches on its nature and its obligations. Satan wants to pollute this. He wants to undermine this authority. Remember, God instituted marriage. Christ elevates it to a sacrament, and he gives that sacrament, and he entrusts that sacrament to his church. Satan wants to undermine this, and the number one way he does this is through the civil authorities trying to not only define marriage, but also having the ultimate authority of marriage. This has always been kind of a conflict uh, between the church and the state. Uh, remember, marriage is a key part to society because marriage is the rock of the family, and family is the rock of society. So in a sense, whoever has the authority over family and marriage um, will have a, a big um, say, of course, in how society goes. So the civil rulers want that. Pope Leo the Thirteenth said in the 1800s and 1880, he said, as then marriage is holy by its own power in its own nature and of itself, it ought not to be regulated and administered by the will of civil rulers, but by the divine authority of the church, which alone in sacred matters professes the office of teaching. So this is the authority of the church, and the church has the authority to teach on it. Let's look at the I in uh, Mrs. P's dimple for indissoluble. Um, that, that word indissoluble comes from loosen. So if you see the S-O-L-V, solve, that means to loosen. Uh, to dissolve means to loosen apart. If you put the N in front of that, then it means to not loosen apart. And this is the marital bond. This is what we're talking about, that this cannot be loosened or taken apart. What God has brought together, let no man bring apart. Um, this is Matthew 19, 6. So important. This is a verse you'll definitely want to memorize, Matthew 19, 6. Um, so if we look at the sacraments, matrimony, of course, is a sacrament. And we look at any sacraments, what's important to the sacrament is that outward sign, right? That outward sign is, is what we would say is the matter. It's the stuff of the sacrament. Um, and then we have the actual words that are used, which is the formula. We use that short for form. So we say form and matter. Form is just short for formula or the words. And then the matter, which is the sensible sign, uh, the stuff of the sacrament. So let's take a few of these. Baptism, for instance. What is the matter or the stuff used in baptism? Particularly water has to be used. What is the form, the words, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit? So if you have the right words, which is the Trinitarian formula, right? If you have the right words plus the right matter, you have a valid sacrament. That means if that took place, both form and matter, you are validly baptized and you will always be validly baptized. Let's take another sacrament, the Eucharist. Uh, what is the stuff, the, the matter that has to be used? Bread and wine. Um, what are the words that must be spoken? It must be spoken by a validly ordained priest, and the words must be the Eucharistic prayer, particularly the consecration, right? This is my body, this is my blood. The correct words, which are instituted by Christ. Um, and then now let's take a look at matrimony, the form and the matter of matrimony. The stuff is, is very simple. It's one man and one woman. This is why we cannot have same-sex unions. This is why we cannot have polygamy. So this fact alone, that there has to be the right matter, 
with a matrimony um, is, is against, of course, same-sex unions and also against polygamy. So one man, one woman. Um, the form here is, is the words, the consent, which we've been talking a lot about, uh, but that consent, that I do, which the couple gives to each other, they give their word, right? And they make this contract of justice to give to another what they rightly do, um, which is the words that they exchange and, and what they will do behind that. So those words imply, of course, free, faithful, full, and fruitful. So we'll look at this from another aspect of the bottom circle being the matter of marriage and then the top two circles here being the form of marriage. What is the matter? One man, one woman. That's the matter. The form is the I do, the consent, and for a Catholic needs to be in front of the church with the clergy, witness, and the right. Non-Catholics are only obligated to the matter and then the one part of the form, the I do. Catholics, however, a baptized Catholic is uh, obligated to all three of these things, matter and form. We'll now take a look at the last part of Mrs. P's dimple, the M, P, L, and E, monogamous, permanence, life, and exclusivity. Uh, we've already taken a look at the great graces of the duties that a man and woman have and also the indissolubility. And now we'll look again at the monogamous, permanent, life, and exclusivity and what these mean. Monogamous simply, of course, means one man and one woman. That man and woman until death open to life and not preventing life, and that they say to each other, you and only you. Satan, of course, hates these four, and so he will attack it with polygamy. He will also attack it with same-sex unions. Both go against the monogamous nature of marriage. He will attack the permanence by divorce. This is prevalent in the 1960s and on, and trial marriages and cohabitation. Of course, at life, he is going to attack that with contraception mentality, and abortion, which we see in the 1930s and 1970s, and then exclusivity he's going to attack with the sin of adultery, both physical and emotional. In the area of uh, life, I want to look at a little bit what the church teaches on this because it's so important. If you look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church on this section on contraception, it will point you to Humana Vitae, uh, Humana Vitae particularly section 14. If you look at the Humana Vitae 14, it'll give you a lot of different references from the church, but one we're going to look at is the Roman Catechism, which is from the time of Trent. Um, and so I want to look at two of these. And Pope Paul VI in 1968 writes in his encyclical Humana Vitae, similarly excluded is any action which either before, at the moment of, or after sexual intercourse is specifically intended to prevent procreation whether as an end or as a means. So we are not able to prevent procreation. The Roman Catechism says in even stronger words, and therefore married persons who to prevent contraception or procure an abortion have recourse to medicine are guilty of a most heinous crime, nothing less than wicked conspiracy to commit murder. Let's just praise Jesus Christ for this wonderful sacrament of matrimony, which God instituted in Genesis 2, Christ elevates in John 2, and that this sacrament has now been entrusted to the church. This sacrament is so important to the salvation of souls, not only important for procreation, new life, but also for the salvation of souls. And this is, of course, this sacrament is a sign of the deeper reality of Christ and the church, which is obviously pointing us to the Trinitarian life. So again, remember you have this family, the groom and the bride, that point us to Christ and the church, and that new life, the sacramental life, the life of grace, which points us to the Trinitarian life. Um, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that eternal life that they have, which they offer us. And so when we go back and we see that Noah um, and those four couples, Noah and his wife and his three sons and, and their wives, this is so important because it's all going to point us to this great sacrament that we enter into, which points us to the church, which points us to the Trinity. I want to finish off this lesson with a great piece of writing from Tertullian. Tertullian lived in the second century. So 1800 years ago we see how important Christian marriage was to society and and we see that Christian marriage is not going anywhere this is a sacrament that's good for the couple but it's also good for society and so we read Tertullian how shall we ever be able to adequately to describe the happiness of that marriage which the church arranges the sacrifice strengthens upon which the blessing sets a seal at which angels are present at witnesses and to which the father gives his consent for not even on earth do children marry properly and legally without their father's permission how beautiful then the marriage of two christians 
two who are one in hope, one in desire, one in the way of life. They follow one in the religion they practice. They are as brother and sister, both servants of the same master. Nothing divides them either in the flesh or in the spirit. They are in very truth two in one flesh. And where there is but one flesh, there is also but one spirit. They pray together, they worship together, they fast together, instructing one another, encouraging one another, strengthening one another. Side by side, they visit God's church and partake of God's banquet. Side by side, they face difficulties and persecution, share their consolations. They have no secrets from one another. They never shun each other's company. They never bring sorrow to each other's hearts. Unembarrassed, they visit the sick and assist the needy. They give alms without anxiety. They attend the sacrifice without difficulty. They perform their daily exercises of piety without hindrance. They need not be furtive about making the sign of the cross, nor timorous in greeting the brethren, nor silent in asking a blessing of God. Psalms and hymns they sing to one another, striving to see which one of them will chant more beautifully the praises of their Lord. Hearing and seeing this, Christ rejoices. To such as these he gives his peace. Where there are two together, there also he is present, and where he is, there evil is not. Thank you for joining me for this very important lesson on the sacrament of matrimony. Um, please uh, continue to take the time to watch the rest of these lessons and enjoy the animal, of course. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, 